We're going to go ahead and get started now. And is this working? I can never tell. Close my face. Oh, perfect. Okay. I hope you didn't get that on the recording. Um, anyway, welcome uh, to tonight's presentation on uh, voting rights uh, 2024, what to know from proposal two. I'm uh, happy to welcome you on behalf of the League of Women Voters and the Ann Arbor District Library. Um, my name is Rebecca Shemke and I am the chair of the League's Voter Services uh, Committee. Um, and I do want to point out that after the presentation, we do have, as you can see, quite a bit of materials. Feel, please feel free to help yourself. Um, so I'm going to just launch right in and introduce our two speakers who I'm very pleased to have with us tonight, spending their, their time. Uh, first, we have Ed Golombuski. I said it wrong. I knew I was going to. Ed G. Um, <laughs> Ed has served as the uh, Chief Deputy Clerk and the Register and Director of Elections at Washtenaw County since 2011, where he oversees the Clerk and Register's Office and directs County Election Administration. He's a 22-year resident of, of Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County, um, in Ann Arbor, and he's an alumnus of e EMU, Eastern Michigan University. He has 19 years of experience overseeing elections at the city, township, and county level in Michigan, and he's administered more than 50 federal, state, county, and local elections. Ed served on several, right? <laughs> Ed has served on several committees. He was recently designated as a certified elections registration administration by the National Association of Election Officials and Auburn University, which is the highest professional achievement for election officials in the county. So welcome, Ed. Our second uh, uh, speaker is Jackie Boudry. Did I get it right? Or Jackie B. <laughs> Jackie has over 20 years of municipal government experience, and she's served as a city clerk for the city of Ann Arbor since 2005. She manages 53 voting precincts, including two full-service satellite offices on the campus of University of Michigan, working with all those um, college students. Jackie has a Master's of Public Administration, also from Eastern Michigan University. She was the 2019 recipient of the Michigan City Clerk of the Year Award. And recently, the City Clerk's Office was awarded the Stars and Stripes Award by the Election Center, which recognized the city's partnership uh, with the University of Michigan for its satellite voting offices. Um, so we have two great experienced speakers who are going to tell you hopefully everything you need to know about our 2024 elections. Turn it over to you two. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that um, lovely introduction. And so Ed and I will go back and forth, um, have the agenda up here for you. So we're kind of going to do um, an overview of what's new since Prop 2. Um, and then um, we'll get into each of the um, new reforms and how that affects you if you're a city voter or if you're part of the county plan. Um, and so then Ed will talk about, um, there's a few outliers as well, but basically we'll go back and forth from if you're city of Ann Arbor, this is what we're doing. And if you're county, this is um, what's happening in the rest of the county. And so we'll go through the big changes from Prop 2 um, in detail. And you probably heard about some of them. Drop boxes, um, we're switching to a permanent ballot mail list, and then ballot tracking. And finally, what you've probably all been waiting for, we'll get into what um, early voting will look like coming up in 2024. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So ballot drop boxes. Um, you probably started to see them around town in your, whether your city or township. Um, a ballot drop box, we started to see them more and more in Michigan in 2020. Um, it's a secure locked box um, that only city clerk or township clerk staff have access to. Um, we use them for both the return of absentee ballot applications as well as for voted ballots. Um, since the 2020 election, we within the city have added more of them around town. So they're not just at City Hall, but you'll find them um, throughout the community. So uh, you might be saying, you know, I've, I've seen a Dropbox at 
you know, at the city clerk's office or elsewhere, you know, at my township, it happens to be Linden Township or something like that. Uh, drop boxes have been used throughout the county uh, for many years, but uh, what we now have is this additional requirement that first that they be used in the first place and also sets a, th uh, sets a threshold. So uh, for every 15,000 registered voters, there has to be one drop box, which means that places like Pittsfield Township now have to add additional boxes if they didn't have them already. So uh, they will be placed um, around uh, the city or township if they're being added by necessity or because the, the clerk uh, of the city or township wants to add additional boxes in a way that's equitable so that uh, voters in the location have sufficient access to a drop box. Uh, and just like it has been uh, over many years, you are required, voters are required to use the drop box that is designated for their city or township. So. If there happens to be more than one, like there are here in the city of Ann Arbor, you could use any of the drop boxes available here in the city if you are a city voter. But if you are registered elsewhere, you've got to use the drop box uh, that's designated for you. And it's really important that you do that so the proper clerk gets the ballot and they can actually make sure it's tabulated uh, on election day. Uh, they are required, drop boxes are required to be available um, around the clock uh, during the 40 days prior to each election. Uh, and up until 8 p.m. on election day itself. Uh, and, you know, there's really no limit. It, each jurisdiction can choose to have as many drop boxes as they think are necessary uh, for their voters. Uh, and, you know, just, it, and, and essentially after the, the immediate threshold is met, that one for every 15,000, they can put them in places that, uh, you know, are either inside a building or just kind of like open uh, periodically, maybe not 24 seven as the statutorily required boxes are. And then boxes indeed are secure. Uh, many of them are monitored, uh, and the slide shows you here that you know they're bolted to the ground. Uh, they're locked in such a way that prevents tampering. But many of them are also monitored, depending on the jurisdiction, uh, via uh, video feed. Uh, that's not the case with every single drop box, uh, but many of them uh, in the county are indeed monitored uh, via video. Um, good question. So we were just talking about that at my office um, before I got here. And I said, what if somebody asked that as we're telling you, you have to put it in the box that you're registered in the city or township. But if you're sitting here going, oh, gosh, I put mine at the Vets Park um, drop box and I actually live in Sio Township. We do everything we can to get that to the Sio Township clerk. So it doesn't invalidate it or make it not count. But think about um, we're collecting them every day, sometimes more than once a day. But if you turned it in on election day and we can't get it to your clerk or it's not Sio Township, it's, you know, New Jersey, which happens if you collect drop boxes on the University of Michigan campus. So yes, we, it, we treat it just like a mailbox and put it in the U.S. mail system or in the case of like Sio or Pittsfield Township, they would actually come to our office and collect it. But, um, as Ed said, we obviously, that will cause a delay. And if it's, you know, the eight o'clock pickup on election day, technically you haven't turned it into the correct clerk. Um, so, but good question. So what's happening in Ann Arbor? So the existing list, we already, as I said, since 2020, we have a box um, it, both inside and outside City Hall, which is right downtown on Ann and Fifth um, and Huron. The box itself is on the Ann Street side of the building. Those will remain. Um, the indoor box, a lot of voters feel more comfortable. They want to get out of their car. They want to come inside and put it inside where they've always done it for years. They're not comfortable with the outdoor box. That's okay. For the one to 15,000, it doesn't count because we lock City Hall. So we can still use that box during business hours, but when we're doing the formula, um, those indoor boxes that we have don't count for the um, required distribution. So we also have boxes at our fire stations. At Fire Station 5 is on North Campus, and Fire Station 6 is in the Briarwood, um, Briarwood Circle area. And then Vets Park is right over here, um, just across the street. And then only in the even years on U of M campus, um, again, those are indoor boxes. We set up our satellite voting office and voters can drop off ballots inside the art museum. We call it UMA, um, the University of Michigan Museum of Art, and then the Deuterstadt building 
Um, also, again, it's a full service clerk's office operation there. And so it has an indoor drop box. What we are adding for the greater community, um, and so that we do meet that one to 15,000 threshold for outdoor accessible boxes, um, Arrowwood Hills just approved us. We're very excited about that partnership. Um, the Arrowwood Hills community has a very high absentee voter rate, and so they're thrilled to be able to now put their ballots right in the drop box um, at Arrowwood Hills. And then here on Hills Golf Course, um, on the northeast side of town, we're also going to add a box um, that you can just pull right in the parking lot, drop your ballot, go ahead and golf if you want, or just keep on going if you don't. Um, and then surprisingly, even though we have a box at City Hall, we hear over and over again, I was walking down here on street, and if the building's locked, I have to go all the way around to the Ann Street side. And so City Hall remains the most popular place to return ballots for voters. So we heard our voters and there will be a box on the Huron Street side of the building as well. Um, so I think I've touched on everything about the city's boxes. Um, Ed, do you want to talk about county? Sure. So Every municipality uh, at, their, at the city or township hall currently has a drop box and will continue to maintain a drop box. Uh, some municipalities have added drop boxes and we'll, pr we'll probably see a few more come along over the next year or so. Uh, so you can see Saline City um, for a relatively small geographic area has two drop boxes. Ypsilanti City now has an additional drop box at the Park Ridge Community Center and at uh, the EMU Student Center. Uh, Pittsfield Township has just added uh, a site at the community center. Superior Township has two as well, one at the utilities building as well as Township Hall. And Ypsilanti Township has four, uh, serving their 55,000 voters at the fire stations and the community center as well as at Township Hall. Ben, could I just one more comment about drop boxes? Um, just one thing I wanted to highlight, if you're a city voter, um, if you can see our box there, that's actually at fire station six. Um, but that same box on Ann Street, it has the ability that we're now allowed, um, you can drive up in your car and deposit your box, your ballot, or the other side on Ann Street is on the sidewalk and the pedestrian side also has a drop slot. So that's a nice feature of the boxes that we have. If you happen to be a city um, resident, particularly in the downtown, you can both drive up and walk up to the box without getting out into the street. So in addition to drop boxes, we now have uh, enhanced options for returning absentee ballots. Um, so first and foremost, and I, and I think this is something that the voters have been asking about for some time. We certainly heard it a lot in 2020. Uh, I want to make sure that my absentee ballot is counted. I want to tabulate it myself. And going forward in 2024 um, and into the future, you will be able to do that if you so choose. You could take your absentee ballot that you've voted to an early vote site and tabulate it, you know, hand feeding it into the ballot tabulator, uh, or you could take it to your election day voting precinct and do the same. Uh, so if you are, you know, someone that wants that additional, uh, you know, I guess personal assurance that you have tabulated your own ballot, you can do that. Uh, of course, the absentee voting process in the state is very secure, uh, has been for many, many years, uh, but now we do have that added ability that if you would like to choose the option, you can tabulate your absentee ballot yourself. In addition to that, uh, it's now more convenient to return your absentee ballot ahead of election day by mail. Uh, when the city or township clerk sends you your ballot or your application, if you're on the permanent list and receive it uh, that way, they're going to send you a means to return it via prepaid postage. So uh, the postage will be covered by the state of Michigan for every election moving forward or every regular election that is moving forward. Uh, and uh, that means that, you know, if, if it's two weeks ahead of Election Day, you've done, you know, you've, you've finished voting your ballot, uh, you can drop it in that prepaid, prepaid envelope and it'll make its way over to your city or township clerk. Now, we still recommend, you know, if it's getting close to the election itself, if you're a few days out from Election Day, please drop your ballot in one of the many uh, drop boxes that are now available specifically in your jurisdiction or hand it directly into the city or township clerk. Okay, so permanent mail ballot list, what does that mean? Um, you're probably thinking, gosh, I thought I was already on the permanent AV list. So we spent a lot of time um, in the city and 
throughout Michigan, um, educating voters about their right to an absentee ballot for no reason. And so we added a lot of people to what we called our permanent AV list. And so prior to Prop 2 in 2022, what you were actually signing up for was an application. So the, the change is that now you can apply one final time to say, send me a ballot for every election. So that's what is different from um, what was what we called the permanent AV application list is now the permanent ballot list. Sure. Okay. So, so what is, you know, what is the permanent mail ballot list uh, and how do you sign up? Um, you can submit a single uh, application uh, at any point in time. Now, right now that would need to either be in writing. Uh, many voters, um, and I think I touch on this in the next slide, many voters that have had an election already this year, and there are many, well, there are several jurisdictions that have, uh, those voters are electing um, in large numbers to transition from the application list over to the ballot list. Uh, and you just check a single box on your absentee ballot application that asks to do so, and then you sign it. Uh, and the state will soon have an, an option for you to do that uh, online. Uh, it is not quite available yet, but it will be prior to the February presidential primary. Uh, and again, that means that, you know, with a single uh, selection, either online or in writing, uh, you'd be able to sign up for this permanent absentee ballot list. If you move uh, within the state of Michigan, you will stay on that list. Uh, every municipality is required to have uh, have this list and you would stay on it uh, and, and be moved over onto the list in your new jurisdiction. And uh, you can choose to tell the clerk where you want to have your ballot mailed. Uh, if it's an address other than your registered address, that's okay. You know, we know many people uh, have temporary residences elsewhere in the country or in the state. Uh, and on a per election basis, you can continue to have uh, that permanent absentee ballot uh, mailed to your uh, the spot that you are in. But it's really important that we know, uh, as election administrators, we know where you're going to be so we can properly send you your ballot. Because ballots, unlike applications, unlike other some, some other election mail, cannot be forwarded. So wherever it ends, that's where it goes. Uh, and if you're not there, it's going to get returned to the clerk's office, we hope. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be sitting in your mailbox waiting for you. Yes. If I, if I can add something to that about, um, and we'll get into this a little bit more on the next slide about what we're doing to implement permanent ballot. But not only are ballots not forwarded, they're not held. So if you're like, oh, I'll trick you and have it sent to my house and I'll just pick it up in two weeks when I get back. Um, ballots that are, if there's any kind of hold mail or forward order, they're returned undeliverable to the clerk's office. So um, that is a consideration for when you're applying for either permanent ballot or for an absentee ballot. If you change your mind and decide you no longer want to be on the permanent absentee ballot list, you can simply uh, ask to be removed from it. Uh, and you'll be taken off. Um, you're also going to be removed from the list if you relocate. So if you move uh, to another state, uh, you would obviously be removed from the voter rolls here in Michigan and also from the permanent absentee ballot list. And also, if you do not cast a vote in six consecutive years uh, or become ineligible to vote for another reason or for some reason, uh, you would be removed from the permanent absentee ballot list. Question here first. <clears throat> then, you know, graduates from U of M or Eastern, moves to another state, they'll still get an absentee ballot at the next election, right? If, if they move to another state and are taken off the Michigan voting rolls, they will not. They, they are no longer... I'm sorry? Who takes them off the Michigan voting rolls? Uh, so a number of different ways. So the Michigan Secretary of State, uh, if they have reason to believe that the person is no longer a resident of the city or township would do that. The city clerk, if they have some reason to think the same, like let's say maybe uh, they're sent a piece of mail, like an absentee ballot application or ballot itself, and it comes back as undeliverable, uh, that's actionable evidence that the person may not be uh, living there anymore. They are placed on a cancellation countdown and sent a notice to confirm 
where they are now living, essentially. Uh, there's other ways as well. Uh, there is a, a process by which many states, including Michigan, uh, participate in an information sharing program to provide um, you know, actionable information to one another saying, you know, I'm now a registered, uh, that someone's a registered voter of one place so that they can be removed from the voter rolls in the place that they formerly lived. We also, um, when we mail out bulk mail, um, you know, our first mailing of absentee ballots in the city might be 20 some thousand ballots. So when we send those um, in our bulk mail to the post office, we also go through a um, like the national change of address um, system in order to get the, the best postage rate, we get that information back. And so even as we're mailing things out, the post office is telling us, hey, it looks like you have some people on your list that maybe um, have forwarded their mail or are no longer here. So um, in Ann Arbor and probably Ypsilanti as well, it's particularly important. And we're constantly doing list maintenance. I just moved a polling place. And so all the voters in that polling place will get a new voter ID card. If some of them come back undeliverable, then we start that cancellation process. Um, so it's a continuous effort in a, any community, but particularly one with a highly transient population. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Um, the second question was also, sorry. sorry so we, for, so uh, the library is live streaming this right now. And the only way that your questions can be heard that way is if you use the mic. So we're going to start. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, Second question is um, for U of M students. Uh, my understanding is that if they're here more than six months of the year, then they can vote here in Michigan, correct? I mean, there's a time period for which they get to vote here. The, the right to vote in Michigan, when you fill out a voter registration form, you swear that you're a United States citizen, that you're at least 18 years of age by election day, so you can actually register ahead of that, and that you're a 30-day resident of the state of Michigan and the city in which you're registering to vote. Okay, and but so, let's say we have, and I experienced this, you have students that are here from Arizona, California, wherever, to U of M, how do you know that they're not voting absentee back in their state? So again, they're, they're filling out a voter registration form and swearing to be a Michigan resident. And as Ed said, we have systems in place to um, check our voter registration against other states. It, it's faster and um, immediate if you were to move from, say, you know, Farmington Hills to Ann Arbor, we would immediately be notifying in our statewide system that clerk. Out of state, it's not as immediate, but um, you're asking me if a voter can commit a felony, which is what voting twice is. So, um, and we even have after election, um, the Secretary of State will reach out to us to say, can you check on such and such a voter? There's a uh, we're concerned that they voted in another place. Um, it's very, very rare. Most people are not out committing voter fraud. I mean, this could happen if you move to Florida and you register to vote in Florida, and unless you proactively cancel your voter registration in Michigan, there is a time lag. So are you but saying- But that doesn't mean you're you saying, actively committing a crime. Right, but are you, are you saying our Secretary of State on a regular basis checks other states if people are here for a limited period of time? We're asked um, periodically after each election, I'm talking about maybe one or two people, can you pull the application to vote? And we wanna check on you know this person's voter status. Okay. Yes, that we we are always checking on our list. And, and what I also think it needs to be shared again is that the interstate information sharing network, that's it's called ERIC, uh, that is perpetual. So yes, on a regular basis, states are comparing information to one another to share updates and to do list maintenance, essentially. I know there was another question too, uh, and I think our, our our partners at the league had suggested that we hold questions until the end. So I think we'll do that to make sure we can stay on time and on, on a slideshow target here. So we'll do that. We want to make sure we answer every single question. Um, so if you have a pen and paper, write it down. If it's something that uh, you want to keep track of, and we'll answer those later on. And we might get to it 
as we move through the presentation. So permanent ballot list, again, like I said, we did all this work to educate people. Hey, you can vote um, no reason absentee and sign up for our list. And now we're going to say, hey, one more time. Um, so we already have 35,000 Ann Arbor voters on what we call the permanent AV list. So um, if you're an Ann Arbor voter and you think you're on this list, look in your mailbox in the next week or so. Um, we are sending out a mailer explaining the difference between permanent ballot and permanent application. And that might sound obvious to you, but um, we're going to go ahead since we don't have a city election in November to give people a chance before it's time to vote to really think about that. Um, like I said, if you maybe own two homes, if you regularly stop and start and forward mail, we're suggesting maybe you want to think about not just stay on the application list that you go ahead and forward me to Traverse City or to Florida or wherever you might be taking your you know, winters or summers. So we're explaining to our voters in Ann Arbor, hey, you're already on this application list. This is kind of how it works. Or maybe you're somebody like me and you're like, hey, every election, guess what? I'm in town. So you can just go ahead and mail me that ballot to my home address in Ann Arbor and I will get it every single time. So put me on the permanent ballot list. So if you're an Ann Arbor voter on our AV list, look for that um, in your mailbox coming very, very soon. Um, and then again, we're working with the Bureau of Elections. There was a thought that maybe permanent AV application was going to go away, but it's our understanding that they are also recognizing that local clerks um, understand that their voters are saying, yeah, I'm not ready for permanent ballot. I, I'm glad that you're offering it, but here's the reasons I might want to be on the application list. So as of right now, we are offering Ann Arbor voters the option to pick um, which one or neither, which one they want to be on. So driven um, in large part by the pandemic, uh, and especially in 2020, we saw a dramatic increase in the number of registered voters that were on the permanent AV uh, application list. Uh, right now, roughly a third of all county voters are on it. Um, and of the 18,437 voters in the county that have uh, been issued an absentee ballot application this year, roughly 13,000 have said that they want to move over to the ballot list. So, you know, nearly 70% uh, of voters that are sent an application currently are choosing to move over to that ballot list. Um, so, you know, it's pretty high, high rate. We expect that that's going to continue. Uh, I think most voters that are choosing a list to be on will probably be on that permanent ballot list uh, and uh, we'll be issuing a lot of ballots that way as we move into the future. Um, you know, we're going to talk about early voting in just a little bit here. Most voters in the county continue to participate via absentee ballot. Uh, it's reduced a bit, but in 2020, during the November uh, election that year, almost 80 percent of ballots cast were via absentee. Uh, and you know, that reduced down to 60 ish uh, percent in 2022, November of 2022. But uh, we do see that the convenience, uh, the security uh, and, you know, with a ballot that's incredibly long in November general elections with hundreds of races in some cases, or at least hundreds of candidates, if not dozens of races, uh, it is very difficult to do your research while you are sitting in the voting booth. So, uh, you know, many voters know that and are choosing to vote absentee for the convenience and time that it provides them to do their research. Okay, so ballot tracking, another feature of uh, the constitutional amendment. Um, and, you know, first question here, doesn't Michigan already have a tracking system? The answer is yes. Uh, for some, some number of years, you voters have been able to uh, find information at the Michigan Voter Information Center, which is michigan.gov slash vote that tells you when your application was sent, when it was received, when your ballot was sent, and when your ballot was received. So you could see that basic information, uh, but it is uh, passive. And uh, what the constitutional amendment requires is that you be notified in an active way going forward. So that means text messages if you want to give your phone number to the clerk's office uh, or email if you'd like your notification that way, letting you know when the city or township has sent or received uh, your absentee ballot materials. And that's going to be available starting next year. It's not quite available yet, uh, but we were very eager uh, 
uh, to move over to that new system and, and allow that service uh, to be used by voters as soon as possible. Okay, so what are we doing um, in Ann Arbor for ballot tracking? So um, we were one of the first communities that we were already emailing our voters. And so if we have your email address um, in the city of Ann Arbor, um, we were sending you an email, hey, your ballot is on its way, so look for it. Um, and then when you returned it, whether you put it in a Dropbox, you put it in the mail, however we got it back, as soon as we checked it into our system, you would get an email telling you not only that we received it, but that we checked your signature and that the ballot was ready for processing at our absent voter count board. And we got a lot, a lot of feedback on that system that voters really appreciated, especially that your ballot's been received. It's all set. There was a lot of mis and disinformation in 2020 about signatures. And so voters really appreciated knowing I heard from the city clerk's office and they already have my ballot and it's it's ready. So we were going to continue to do that local notice um, until we feel satisfied with whatever um, the state is sending out that it either is as good or better than what we're doing. So um, expect to continue to hear from the clerk's office until you start getting something from the Secretary of State's office with essentially the same information. And then as for the rest of the county, uh, city and township clerks uh, in Washtenaw have not adopted the pioneering uh, email notifications that the city has, which are excellent. And Jackie didn't even mention the digital I voted sticker, which is also cool. Um, but yeah, the city of Ann Arbor is absolutely a pioneer here and uh, we're very eager for the rest of the state uh, and I think there are probably only a few municipalities across the state that are as proactive about uh, absentee ballot notifications as the city is um, to begin adopting a similar strategy. Okay, so early voting, what you've all been waiting for. So what is early voting? Um, this, again, similar to permanent ballot, we already adopted this language when we had no reason AV, at least in the city of Ann Arbor, we didn't force voters to understand, I want to vote early. Okay, here's the option we have. You can get an absentee ballot. You can do that in person in our office or in our satellite office, or we can mail you a ballot and you can vote early. But now true early voting is coming. And that means that voters will have the opportunity to go to an early vote center and actually cast their ballot. So instead of voting early with an absentee ballot, which you can still do, um, the new right is that you could go to an early vote center and actually have an election day sort of experience where instead of turning in a signed envelope, you're just dropping that ballot right into the scanner. Um, so that is the difference between, as you can see in our poster, um, we were in 2020, vote early, you know, there's a pandemic, come out to the office early and vote. But the, the change now is that we'll still have these early mail options, um, but you will actually be able to, if you choose, tabulate your own ballot early. Oh, okay, I can do this. So um, when will early voting take place or where, excuse me, at early voting sites? And we'll go through the um, various sites between um, the city and county, but you're actually sitting in one of the city's early voting sites. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but we're very um, happy to have the Ann Arbor District Library as our partner for early voting. Um, so voters will, very similar to their election day polling place, they will go to some sort of, might be regional, might be city or township based um, site that they can vote. Um, when will this happen? This is a constitutional amendment in Prop 2. So starting the second Saturday before the election. So the nine days are two Saturdays before the election, ending on the Sunday just prior to election day. So the nine days don't count back from election day. And we're working on our messaging of how we will tell voters that. But the best we have is that two Saturdays before the election is when it starts. So you'll have the opportunity over Saturday, Sunday, a whole week, Monday through Friday, and then another Saturday, Sunday. So there's gonna be a lot of options for voters um, besides, again, mail ballots. Um, early voting will have a lot of different opportunities 
for um, your individual schedules. And the Constitution says that those nine days, you have to be available at least eight hours. And so there's flexibility for communities to decide what works best, whether that might be early mornings or some evenings. Um, but again, it's you have that those two weekends besides the um, weekdays for think of people who work or something might choose a Saturday. Um, can communities offer early voting even when it's not required? And the answer is yes. So it's required in um, all state and federal elections. So imagine a special election in May or maybe a city election in an odd year. Um, we're not required to offer early voting in anything other than the nine days in the even year or state elections. Um, but many communities you will see will mirror their even year plans, even for special elections. They will have um, that availability to you as a voter. Um, you can also, obviously, within the election period, you can extend the nine days um, farther back, not into Sunday, Monday, or I mean, excuse me, not into Monday, um, but you would start earlier than the two Saturdays if a community chose to do that. Um, so we'll talk about, again, our individual plans, but they're, the minimum is those nine days for eight hours. And then can communities work together to offer early voting? And the answer is yes. So a community could choose to go alone and just service the voters that they service for absentee and election day voting. They could partner with a neighbor or several neighbors, or they could ask the county clerk if they could um, coordinate um, multiple smaller cities or townships as a, as a group. So there's a lot of options um, for how early voting will be implemented, but the key for voters, whether your city or township or another county even, is that you will have those nine days um, minimum of eight hours no matter where you live. Okay, so specifically here, uh, you're looking at a map of Washtenaw County and the jurisdictions on it that are uh, conducting early voting independently. There are four, uh, the city of Ann Arbor, obviously, uh, Ypsilanti Township, Bridgewater Township, and the city of Milan. And the other 22 municipalities in the county uh, are partnering with the county clerk's office to conduct uh, early voting essentially uh, in coordination with them uh, and in partnership. Uh, that means that, you know, for those 22 municipalities, the county clerk's office and the county election commission will be heavily involved with poll worker recruitment, training, um, and, uh, you know, management, essentially. Uh, we will be conducting and, and coordinating early voting sites that we're serving or that we are, uh, that we're arranging. Um, and I'll talk about those plans more in just a moment. Um, you know, the county plan and, and the cities and, and townships that are going separately uh, equal to about half and half. Uh, so regardless of where you live, you are going to have an early vote site. You're probably going to have more than one. Uh, the city has essentially six during major elections uh, and county uh, plans uh, will call for at least two uh, for uh, voters elsewhere uh, in uh, the, the county coordinated plan area. Uh, the, the townships that are conducting uh, early voting Bridgewater will have one early vote site in the township. Ypsilanti Township will have two early vote sites and uh, Milan City will have one. So now we'll kind of talk about the specific locations and a little bit more of the details um, that go into this planning. So early voting in the city of Ann Arbor. So as Ed said, Ann Arbor will run their own early voting. Um, obviously, we're the largest city in the county and um, some of you, I think, are poll workers and some of you are registered voters in Ann Arbor. But obviously, with the University of Michigan, we have um, a unique set of challenges and opportunities for early voting on um, in the city. So with our plans that we already have in place on campus, it made most sense for us to continue to operate um, as a single entity for early voting as well. So citywide, Ann Arbor voters can go to City Hall, which will be very familiar um, because for most voters who were choosing to vote early in person, they were coming to City Hall and asking for an absentee ballot. So if they weren't doing mail voting and 
the voter was choosing to come early, but still um, getting an absentee ballot. That might be somebody who says, I'm going to go to City Hall, but now I might as well just go ahead and cast my ballot since I'm here. So City Hall will be for all city voters. And then in February, presidential primary and the November general, um, we will open our satellite offices on campus. And again, that's at the Art Museum, UMA, and the Duderstadt Center is on North Campus. Those are open to all city voters. We primarily service students there, but um, we certainly have um, faculty and staff or even downtown workers who find the art museum to be convenient for them. Um, so it is just to be clear, while a vast majority of people who come there are coming to register to vote, it will also be an early vote center if that happens to be convenient for you. What we're imagining most Ann Arbor voters who choose to vote early besides the campus community, um, that they will take advantage of the opportunity to vote um, a little closer to their home if they don't live near downtown. And so the Ann Arbor District Library enthusiastically joined us as a community partner, and we're very happy about that. So we have decided that the libraries will be based on the city wards. That makes the most sense in terms of communicating to voters um, which branch they will go to. But basically, if you're in wards one and two, um, you will go to Traverwood, which is the northeast side of town. And then wards three and four are at Mallets Creek, which is south central. And then um, this branch here, Westgate, will be for ward five. Um, so those will be open the nine days and um, the hours are not yet determined but the, the three library sites will be based on where you're registered to vote. Um, and then I should mention that we just had these sites approved officially by city council um, last night. And so voters will also get a notice in the mail that is specific to their voter registration. So I happen to live in the fourth ward. And so the card that I get will list the three citywide options as well as Mallets Creek. So we won't confuse people by listing all of the locations. So your card will tell you, hey, you can go um, to Traverwood or wherever your site might be. So again, um, our plan in Ann Arbor is to offer early voting in all city elections. So that would include um, any special elections that we might have. Um, if you're a city voter, we used to have odd year elections every year but you may recall that city council switched to even year staggered terms. So for example, this November coming up, um, we don't have a special election. So we no longer have the days where we always had city council in the odd year. But if in the event that we do have something, um, we will offer early voting. Again, the campus locations, I kind of already highlighted this, um, will be only for major elections and, and also not in August. And that's just based on um, our experience there with what is um, demanded. So we won't use those sites other than um, even your November or the presidential primary every four years. Um, City Hall will be available to all voters. We find um, it there will probably be a transition period where we expect City Hall to remain busy, um, that voters have that muscle memory that I go early, I go to City Hall, I get my ballot directly from the clerk. You'll still do that, except if you don't want a mail ballot, you'll just go to what will appear to be more of a polling election day sort of setup rather than coming to the clerk's window. Um, we will have evenings and weekends are required. We have, again, like I said, that two Saturdays, so two full weekends um, of hours. City Hall currently in October of even years, we've done this, I think, since 2020. and to follow um, the evening schedules as well. So we don't have set hours yet because we're still kind of um, sorting out, you know, sort of how February works out for us and, and making our plan for November after we have at least one election of experience. But if you're an Ann Arbor voter, definitely expect to see flexibility in the time besides just the dates. 
And we are also contemplating um, for November only that we may very well extend our early voting. Um, we'll see again what February looks like for us. And if we have the capacity, we would like to be able to start um, early voting a little sooner if that's what voters are interested in doing. Um, so I think that is all I have about the plan. I'll let Ed talk about um, the county plan before we get into questions. Okay, so uh, first, just by um, way of background, you know, Michigan is an incredibly decentralized state when it comes to election administration, and for that matter, all you know, uh, administration at, at the local government level. We in Wisconsin, um, I think, share the unique situation of having, um, you know home rule cities and townships, uh, you know, that have the majority, frankly, of election administrative responsibilities uh, in this state. So, you know, the city or the township clerk where you live, uh, they are the, the chief election official, official for your municipality. The county, uh, in our capacity, we serve as, as a coordinator in many ways, uh, but counties in the state of Michigan uh, by constitution are set up as a bit of the arm of the state. So uh, we serve in in some some functions that um, you know the state can't reasonably do because they don't have uh, the ability to do it at a more local level. Um, the county programs ballots. We train election inspectors. Uh, we handle candidate filings in many ways for many offices um, and campaign finance reporting. But what we have not done in this state, uh, and I and I speak for all counties, is hire poll workers to deploy to early voting sites and conduct uh, essentially election day polling place operations until now. Uh, and the reason for that, I mean, there's a few, but a major one is that, again, because we are a decentralized state, we've got 1,600, close to it, municipalities, cities and townships of varying degrees of resources. Uh, even in Washtenaw County, we've got, you know, the city of Ann Arbor, uh, which has a, a large and excellent team uh, of folks in the clerk's office. Uh, we also have jurisdictions that have part-time election officials, um, in some cases who's, you know, in one case at least, whose main day job is working as uh, an elementary school special education instructor. That's a demanding thing on its own adding the responsibility for conducting early voting over nine full days prior to every major election, um, it adds some burdens that some municipalities simply cannot take on uh, without as additional assistance. That uh, and that there's efficiencies that can be created by uh, coordinating early voting um, in a distributed way or in a, I guess in a way that uh, allows for um, you know, a single entity to work with a number of partners to accomplish it. So um, in Washtenaw County, uh, again, there are, there are four municipalities that are going to be conducting early voting independently. Uh, and there are 22 that are entering into the county coordinated early voting plan. Municipalities that are going to participate in that plan uh, will have a regional site uh, that is dedicated for their use. Uh, and they will also have access to a, you know, quote, central site uh, located at the Washtenaw County Learning Resource Center, uh, which is just on the east side of the city of Ann Arbor, uh, actually in Pittsfield Township, uh, that will be, again, open to all registered voters in the participating 22 municipalities. So there's two options. We wanted to open the central site in addition to the regional options. You know, the regional option obviously serves you where you live or closer to where you live. Uh, and the central site would serve you uh, where maybe you work or do business. Uh, a lot of folks, especially from the outlying areas, do work in the city of Ann Arbor or near it, uh, and this would be a site that's accessible to them. Uh, this visualizes the uh, the regions on the map, and you can see the early vote site locations as well that are dedicated uh, to each, each municipality. Uh, so in region one on the west side of the county, you can see uh, that the Sylvan Township Hall will serve as the early vote site for that region. Region two, uh, the early vote site is the Sio Township Hall. Region three, the Ypsilanti Freight House. Region four, the Pittsfield Township Hall. And then again, that central site, the star, uh, is the, uh, the location where all of those 22 municipalities could have voters uh, come and vote early. The goals here, you know, ultimately what we wanted was to, again, reduce the burden on city and township clerks. Uh, it's a large number of poll workers that are needed. It's a large volume of administrative tasks to have to, to take on. Uh, and our role at the county, uh, as, as I see it, 
is to support city and township clerks as much as we possibly can. Uh, and that's what this uh, endeavors to do. We also want to provide convenience for voters. You know, again, uh, municipalities in um, or, or, or smaller jurisdictions, I suppose, uh, would have a hard time providing more than one uh, early vote site. We're going to provide two to every voter that's participating in this plan. Uh, we also standardize things, and Jackie pointed this out earlier, messaging is incredibly difficult right now uh, with so many new changes and so much to tell voters. Um, you know, we're so thankful for this opportunity to begin doing that uh, and to have, you know, a, a shared message that we're communicating. The more jurisdictions that we can be talking about at the same time, uh, you know, the more uh, options that voters have that we can kind of condense into, you know, a single slide, uh, the better. You know, it's, it's going to make things uh, easier for us to be able to tell voters um, when we have, you know, standardized options for them. County coordinated early vote sites will be open during all elections, including special elections. Uh, the hours of operation right now are set at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, those might adjust heading into certain elections, like, you know, perhaps the November election next year. We may offer some evening hours as well. Uh, and they'll be staffed by election inspectors uh, that are hired and trained by the Washington County Clerk's Office. And you can see there on the bottom of the slide, uh, we very much need to recruit new poll workers uh, and also you know, ask poll workers that have done it before to consider uh, serving as an early voting site election inspector, not only you know, at the county coordinated sites, but also in the city of Ann Arbor. Jackie's previous slide uh, made mention of the fact that they need folks as well. Uh, we certainly are going to continue to coordinate our, our, our efforts to make sure that poll workers are, you know, dispatched to where they're needed. Uh, you can see there that the link washington.org slash poll worker, uh, we've got an interest form that folks can complete to say, you know, whether you're interested in working at an election day voting precinct or an absentee voter count board at a specific city or township. Uh, and also if you would be interested in serving as an early voting site election inspector, uh, and we'll gather that information and very much, uh, and I'll be reaching out to folks uh, in earnest here over the next couple of months, because uh, knowing that we need folks, again, over nine full days, there are varying degrees of availability. You know, who's got nine full days that they can commit to working? Well, we're happy to find them. We, we need those people. Uh, but we know also that we're going to have to uh, uh, accept the fact that election inspectors will work a single day of those nine early days or nine days of early voting. You know, we need a lot of people involved. Uh, so the more uh, interest we can gain now, uh, the better. So please be encouraged to reach out uh, to an election administrator and declare your interest in serving as a poll worker. Um, I, I didn't mention it um, when I had talked about the city's plan, but we did already reach out. If you're a city um, election inspector, meaning you normally work at, at either our satellite offices or on one of our city precincts, um, if you're on our list, we've already reached out to you to start that survey of, like Ed was saying, hey, are you thinking nine days plus election day? Um <laughs> or a couple days plus election day. Because of course the interesting challenge for us is that we still have to operate our election day precincts. And so we don't wanna lose our, especially our chair people. Um, we want them to consider both, but we obviously still need people um, for election day as well as um, the early voting. And so we're hoping that some of our regulars, um, and they've indicated that if you were one of the people who filled out our survey, that a lot of people are interested in doing both election day and early voting. Um, but I just wanted to say, so typically like from the city's perspective, we will, our initial recruitment will be our existing workers. And I would assume the county will reach out to the county, the township workers. Um, but if you're already on our list, um, we would, we should have already contacted you. The, so the, that's a great question. <laughs> it's a really great question that a lot of people, including both of us want to know. So, uh, unfortunately it is still not officially set as February 27th, barring further action by the Mich Michigan legislature. Uh, the legislature needs to adjourn early. Uh, in order to accomplish that, or some other thing needs to happen, basically, uh, without going into all the details. But, <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. So it's, we, we might not know until November 9th, you know, it basically is what Jackie's saying right now. You know, there's, um, it, and that will be a very oh, tight. Uh, right. Yeah. I'm right. hearing I, that was an early date compared to what right. I had this year. Right. Right. Got it. Yeah. So, um, so unfortunately we cannot tell you with exact certainty. We do believe, you know, it'll be in February on the 27th, but, uh, if not that, March 12th, uh, that would be the normal date before the legislature took action to adopt a new public act this year, moving it up early. So believe me, we will tell you as soon as, soon as we know <laughs> the exact date. And also just one more note on poll workers. I think we're just so fortunate here in Washtenaw County to have so many uh, people very interested in serving at the polls. Um, other counties do not have the luxury of sending um, poll worker recruits elsewhere. Uh, we were in that situation in 2020. We had this, you know, really outpouring of, uh, of, of interest and, you know, a lot of people that wanted to get involved. And we were so thankful for that. Uh, and we're really looking forward and, and hoping that that's again the case next year, uh, because we'll need a lot of new talent uh, to bring into the fold, in addition to relying on so many folks that have done uh, this sort of work for, for many years. Okay, with that, uh, questions. And uh, raise your hand, and I think our, our friend from the library is going to come around with a microphone so that uh, the folks at home can hear too. Uh, earlier, I, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly what slide uh, you were talking about, but you talked about um, after a ballot is received at the clerk's office and it was signed by the voter, and you mentioned that that you know the signature was validated as a part of the whole you know, tracking process that I as a voter can see. Um, can you uh, speak to exactly how you validate a signature on a ballot that you receive in the mail? You wanna take it? Sure. So the um, Michigan qualified voter file is linked to the Michigan driver's file. And we actually have a digital copy of the voter signature. So when absentee ballots are returned at the local level to city and township clerks, we um, they're barcoded and we scan that ballot into our QVF, we call it the acronym qualified voter file and the voter signature pops up and we do an actual verification of every single return ballot. And then we stamp the ballot in date and time received and the staff person who made the signature check initials that they've um, checked in the ballot and that the signature is acceptable. So that is done for every single ballot that we check in. My question is, how do you read signatures any longer? The way, the way people just, just, how do you read a signature? Well, we're not handwriting experts, but um, whether somebody very, you know, purposefully writes out every letter of their signature or they have kind of a scribble, you'd be surprised that the scribble is the same. I mean, I have a very long name and I sign a lot of documents and I probably don't sign every letter, but it's the same every time. So that's what mine looks like on my driver's license too. Yeah. And mine's Golombiewski. So it's, you know, even worse. <laughs> mine's just, yeah. Um, and it, in addition, so when the clerk's office does find that a signature does not match, they will not accept that ballot to be tabulated. They do notify and are required to notify the voter of an irregularity uh, and provide a means to cure uh, that signature, you know, deficiency. Uh, but you know, if if we cannot be confident that the signature matches, uh, we are not going to tabulate that ballot. Next question. Uh, yeah, I got a couple of questions. Uh, with all this added availability to vote, will um, uh, the state of Michigan ever require that a valid ID be presented as opposed to just signing a affidavit stating who you are? So currently, uh, the law and, uh, in fact, the Constitution read uh, that um, it is acceptable in lieu of having one of the uh, statutorily provided uh, forms of photo identification uh, that one can sign that affidavit of voter not in possession of photo ID if you truly do not have one. Uh, and you know, we, we do accept that and we'll continue to accept that until there is some subsequent change. Uh, the, and in fact, the list of acceptable photo IDs has grown uh, a bit as well uh, to include those that are issued by counties. So for instance, the Washtenaw County ID card can now be used uh, as photo identification at the polls. And I was just gonna add that um, it, the affidavit is in 
our experience, I mean, we're talking like a handful per election. Um, and it's not a refusal to show ID. The affidavit is because you forgot your ID. It doesn't mean you don't have ID, but we're not going to make somebody go all the way home after they just stop to vote. And they're, you know, you see it in August. Oh, I was out on a walk and I voted, you know, Dick in elementary and I just walked on in and no, no ID. So I signed the affidavit. Um, so we see it in, in the May and August elections for that reason, but it's, I don't have it on my person, not, I refuse to show it just to make that distinction. And, uh, uh, regarding the numerous, um, um, trying to think of the word irregularities that occurred in all of the battleground states of the 2020 election, uh, will there be any, pre any, uh, additional procedures to guard against something like that re of reoccurring again. Okay, so um, in Michigan, uh, we have a rigorous set of uh, safety mechanisms, essentially, and security that are built into our process. Uh, they start very early in the process with, um, you know, the, the proofing and review of ballots, and then the proper uh, logic and accuracy testing of voting equipment that's done in the open during public meetings that anyone can attend. Uh, we rely on teams of bipartisan poll workers, Republicans and Democrats, and in some cases, those representing minor parties as well, working side by side uh, in tabulation environments. So that it means early voting precincts it, or uh, sites. It means election day and it means the absentee voter count boards as well. Uh, the review of all of the election returns after they have been returned to uh, the city and township uh, is conducted again by a bipartisan team of poll workers called the receiving board, who then forwards those returns to the county, uh, where, again, a bipartisan group called the Board of Canvassers uh, reviews every uh, bit of election paperwork to ensure that the total number of voters uh, equals the total number of ballots cast uh, and reconciles any problems or differences, um, including retabulating ballots if necessary, or retabulating entire precincts uh, if we can't ascertain uh, a proper reason uh, why the numbers might not balance. Afterward, we send the results on to yet another bipartisan board. Uh, the Board of State Canvassers meets and convenes to review all state and federal uh, uh, election returns before finally um, certifying the outcome of the election. Uh, it would, and I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, we, I think, in, in many ways are very fortunate to to be in a, in a state that has uh, a decentralized system when it comes to security. We don't do things the most efficiently. Uh, we do things very differently than just our neighbor to the south in Ohio. Uh, but what we do have is this vast network of election administrators, precincts, and you know, residents that are a part of this process. There are thousands and thousands of people uh, that live in the state of Michigan that touch this process that it would be incredibly hard, infinitesimally difficult to effectuate a systemic fraud uh, that was not detected by someone involved in these processes. And again, these are, these are you know, the people sitting next to us in this room. These are, uh, these are the residents of our community uh, that are tabulating ballots, uh, that are reviewing the returns, that are satisfied and, and certifying those results uh, as, as official and accurate before sending them on. Congressional District 12, which is now six, uh, it was never officially certified. The results of Congressional District 6 were, were certified, along with all of the other uh, state and federal offices in the state. Because the two Republicans that were to sign on to that, they never officially certified that. They only did it on condition if a, if an, a ballot audit would have been undertaken, which it never was. So they never officially certified other than the two Democrats who did. Um, again, the, the, those results were certified. Uh, I believe you're talking about Wayne County and those results were certified along uh, with all other races in the state, including at the county level as well as the state level. There's proof to show otherwise. I think there was also um, the Michigan legislature conducted a bipartisan study of the Michigan election and there's a lot of mis and disinformation about the 2020 election, but there was a bipartisan report issued 
that said there was absolutely zero evidence of any wrongdoing in Michigan. All right, next question. Hopefully an easy one. <laughs> With the new changes, can we process or can you process, uh, can you tabulate absentee ballots ahead of the election now? Yes, you can. Uh, so uh, in, and there's essentially two different options uh, that depend on the population size of the jurisdiction. So large jurisdictions can uh, begin processing absentee ballots in an absentee voter count board that is operated by election inspectors uh, starting nine days prior to election day, uh, or eight days, excuse me. Uh, and other jurisdictions can begin the day before. So they would be able to start processing on Monday uh, and you know tabulating ballots at that time. It absolutely merits note that in no environment, no uh, you know uh, uh, occasion whatsoever can results be shared or actually even produced uh, using voting equipment or any other means uh, prior to 8 p.m. on election day when the polls close. It is a crime in Michigan to disseminate election results prior to that. So despite the fact that absentee ballots will be processed in, in you know, probably a number of jurisdictions uh, ahead of election day, they are not being tabulated in such a way that we're generating results, uh, and those results will not be known, just like right now, until 8 p.m. on election day. How many people in here are poll workers or have been? Oh, a lot. Very proud. Um, yes. <laughs> so you'll, if you work early voting, you will just like it's two o'clock on election day, you will see the um, maybe a hundred people have come through this library and you will balance out at the end of your day, just the numbers and then like what Ed is saying, the actual tallying of yeah. winners and losers and yeses and noes will be at eight o'clock at City Hall on election day. So you will just be every day balancing out the number of voters ballots cast, but you won't see any results here at the library or wherever you might work. Um, a different team will actually finalize the, the machines yeah that have already been taken to city hall and the tallies will be run at eight o'clock. And, and just one more thing to add, you know, th this is, it's become a bit of a necessity in certain jurisdictions, especially larger jurisdictions for this to occur, uh, given the incredible volume of absentee ballots that they are processing. Uh, and the fact that prior to 2020, um, and in a very limited case in 2020, uh, it required, the work of election inspectors starting at 7 a.m. on election day and ending whenever they ended, uh, in many cases, five, six in the morning, the day following, uh, to process that volume. And that was before uh, we had the dramatic increase in absentee ballots that are now being requested by voters. Uh, and, you know, if we continue to see voters choose um, instead of going to their election day voting precinct to vote absentee, we have to allocate resources and process those ballots in such a way um, that acknowledges that, you know, actual human beings are involved and we can't make people work, uh, you know, 24 or 30 hours in a row uh, doing that, uh, that incredible volume of, uh, of labor. So, um, you know, it's, it's not, um, you know, it, it's, it's not because we're, you know, so eager to start, you know, running those ballots to the tabulators. We really need to, uh, in order to be able to process the volume in time uh, to meet, um, you know, what the public expects is reporting obligations. You know, no, no one wants to wait until noon the day following an election to know who won. Uh, people expect, and, you know, this is no fault of voters, it's no fault of election administrators, but people expect to know on election night. Uh, and it's very difficult for us to be able to produce those results timely uh, if we don't have a bit of a head start in pre-processing absentee ballots. Next question. Hi, uh, I, I'm, I live in Ann Arbor, but I've been a, um, an election inspector and precinct chair for seven years since the 2016 election in Ypsilanti City. And I've attended many of your presentations for training. Um, great presentations. Um, and I just want to, well, I have a comment, but I also have a question. Um, so I'll try and make it quick. Um, at, you know, in my seven years experience, there's very little room for error because we have to, you know, there have been times where our, the number in the tabulator doesn't match the number in the e-poll book, which is like the, uh, the, the, the computer. When somebody comes to, to uh, register to vote or, or comes to apply to vote, if they don't have their you know, if, they, if we'll have them sign an affidavit, if they don't have an identity, 
you know, identification, any photo ID, but they have to say, we don't have a photo ID. Not that we refuse to show you a photo ID. We don't have a photo ID. If they refuse to show us a photo ID, then we can't, we won't let them sign the affidavit. We can't, you know? Um, and even if they don't have a photo ID and they sign an affidavit, we have to, check their name in the system and check that off so that nobody else can come and say, no, I'm voting and I'm that person. Then there'll be a discrepancy, you know? So there, there's a pretty tight system of checks and balances um, there. And, you know, we check our, I mean, I have been in that situation where, you know, at the end of the day, our numbers aren't matching and we're there to like two, three in the morning and then finally taking it to city hall to try and find the discrepancy. So now we have like, I'm like, okay, we have to have a system of like a tight, system of checking every 10 minutes or five minutes, does the number in the tabulator match the number in the e-poll book? Um, a lot of people feel, quite frankly, people, some people have been hostile. We face this several times when we run their name in the e-poll book, like, why do you have my information? Well, we want, it's, it's a system of, you know, checking to make sure that people aren't, you know, there, there isn't fraudulent voting. So there's very little room for error there. Um, having said all that, the last election in, in Ypsilanti town, uh, city, I was given the choice of either working as a precinct chair or, um, in city hall counting the absentee ballots ahead of time. They wouldn't let us do both. Is that going to change now? Like for some of us who want to do more than one, one service? Well, certainly you're going to, you're going to be able to work as an elect early voting, uh, election inspector or poll worker, as okay. well as an election day, um, election inspector. But, you know, as to the specifics of what each municipality is going to do and how they're going to allow you to, you know, sign up or what, um, they'll allocate you to, which part of the process, it is a local, uh, local jurisdiction decision. So, okay. uh, I would certainly direct you to Ypsilanti city to ask that. Okay. All right. I, I wouldn't want to either to speculate on what the city was their rationale was but they may what we did for pre-processing ahead of election day we used the same people that worked in the absentee count board so um it may have been if you're going to be at the polls we'll keep you at the polls and the people who are doing the absentee ballots were the people that we utilized um both on monday and tuesday yeah, and there's another, I just wanted to add this quickly too, that with absentee ballots, again, another system of checks and balances, when somebody was issued an absentee ballot, not to accuse people, but sometimes people forget that they got an absentee ballot in the mail and they might have sent it way ahead of time and forgotten about it. So when they come in person to vote, we check. And if it says absentee ballot received and processed, we tell them, listen, you might have forgotten, but like you did receive an absentee ballot and we you did send it in and city hall has received it. So we can't issue you another ballot. You know, there's, it's right. a pretty tight system. I mean, I voted in other, like in American elections from other countries living abroad. And um, I've also seen elections in other countries and I'm impressed with the American system. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I had a couple questions here. Um, First of all, um, in the past, if you are uh, a poll worker, election inspector, you work all day. Is that going to be the same for all the early voting period? Um, well, I'll answer for Ann Arbor and then I'll let um, Ed answer for the county. So um, if you're an Ann Arbor election inspector, we did survey our um, workers to say what do you think is your interest? What is your availability? I mean, we might have some people who are taking the day off work on Tuesday, the traditional election day, and I'm interested in getting these extra hours on Saturdays and Sundays, but I can't do, you know, those five days. And so we're really looking at um, knowing that it's a big ass for possibly 10 days if they're going to also work election day. What are you interested in? What can you do? And then um, we used to be very strict about the not wanting to do a half day or a split shift at the polls. And we actually in the campus area started um, recruiting students and we've become a lot more flexible with schedules um, to both meet the needs of possible new workers as well as um, staff our precincts. So I would say for Ann Arbor, um, obviously, you know, a couple of hours isn't super helpful, but that we are certainly looking at um, 
half days or, or, and certainly the understanding that not everyone is going to work for nine straight days. Okay. Yeah. And at the County, same, you know, we, we know we're not going to be able to find a, 80 people to work all nine full days. Uh, we're hoping that folks can make that full day commitment um, and we'll take it, you know, for one day. Um, we'll see, I suppose. We're going to have to evaluate the availability of the recruits that we're seeing. Um, and if it turns out that we have to offer split shifts, we will. You know, we're going to do whatever we can to make this as convenient as possible. Um, and again, the early voting hours um, are in all cases, I think, for the city to eight hours. You're not going beyond at least in the February uh, presidential primary. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, eight hours plus maybe, you know, an hour or two hours to allow for opening and closing to, to occur. So um, yeah, you know, that's, 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 that's the commitment and we'll be as flexible as we can, um, you know, up to reasonable limits. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my second question is I know that there's various uh, voter integrity groups out there working, looking at uh, ballots that have been, cast in the past and as an example in ann arbor they found uh people that were listed on floor seven of a three-story building that were vote that had voted and uh so there's a lot of effort going into cleaning up the voter roll um at what point in time do those cleanup records have to be submitted to the clerks in order to get the uh voter roll cleaned up so just to clarify, um, it, and maybe you misspoke, you're looking at registration lists because the ballot is a secret ballot. And so no one is looking at a voter's ballot and determining who, who sorry, voted what ballot. So yeah. I just wanted that to be very clear. Um, right. We have received Freedom of Information Act requests to look at our ballots, um, but no one has actually paid the fee to examine ballots. But you wouldn't be able to determine um, what voter cast what ballot. You would just be looking at the 55,000 plus ballots, depending on the election. Um, if there is a concern from a registered voter about another voter's eligibility, um, there is a process for challenging a voter's registration, if that's what you're asking. Um, and what's, it, the death, what's the timeline? Well, there's not really a timeline. Um, are you talking about to like they wouldn't be removed? We would just be um, contacting the voter regarding a challenge to their registration. We don't remove people. We ha we have a, con a cancellation countdown process. We don't just take somebody off our list. Okay. I mean, you can. I don't know the particular case that you're talking about, but we might have. Um, for example, we had someone register to vote at a U storage and we reached out and it turned out that the person actually was the resident manager. Now you get, that's one case, but then you talk about somebody that's maybe temporarily unhoused. They don't lose their right to vote. So there are a lot of cases where you may be jumping to a conclusion that there's something wrong or that it's fraudulent and not everybody's as fortunate as we are to say, well, I've lived in the same house for 25 years. So um, there are cases of situations that we even have the ability what we address. Um, that might be the home. I'll spend the night. So just keep that in mind. I don't know the case that you're talking about. Okay. And my last question here, and then I'll pass it on here. Um, I saw that there was a, uh, a news article that there was a, a federal court challenge to uh, Proposition 2, that it was illegal because it wasn't passed by, you know, the required vote of the legislature. It should not have been a, a voter initiative. Can you... Uh, talk about that and what, when that would might, what impact that might have. I mean, we can't really speculate at this point. I would say, uh, you know, we are we're we're fairly down uh, the chain uh, on on administration. We are the practitioners. Uh, so, if there were some court order, federal or otherwise, uh, that impacted proposal two in any way, obviously we would react to that and we would react immediately. Um, what reaction that would be is impossible to say, not knowing what, you know, might 
might happen. Um, I really don't know. I, I, I don't think we could really say much about the veracity of that uh, 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 suit that's been filed. Um, no doubt there will probably be others. I can say that. And I, I think it's probably fairly likely there'll be plenty of litigation uh, over the next year plus. Um, and, you know, uh, election administrators are quite used to that. We've been, um, unfortunately, in the situation many times where um, things changed, uh, ch things change abruptly, um, and we immediately pivot and continue to uh, administer elections on behalf of the voters that we serve. So um, right now, I think far too early to think about, um, you know, legal challenges to Prop 2. We are proceeding, uh, knowing uh, what the situation is today, and we'll continue to do that and uh, make adjustments if necessary. And on that note, I'd just like to say, because I asked, like, I think three quarters of the room are either current or former, or you've worked in election. And so it's not just me and Ed at the local level, um, it's you guys. And so it's been a little bit of a rough road since 2020. So I just wanted to thank you guys for continuing to, because we can't do it without you. So I do thank you. So my question, um, first of all, thank you for a great presentation, lots of superb information. Um, evidence through FOIA documents through Ann Arbor City and publicized in some of the local press, we are aware that there were numbers of students who registered to vote beyond the eight o'clock time stamp line that should be enforced. So what will we be doing to prevent that type of illegal behavior in the future? So voters have a right under Proposition 18.3, which was the, um, they're both propositions are loosely called promote the vote. So Proposition 18.3 passed in November of 2018. And under 18.3, Michigan implemented same day voter registration. We used to have a 30 day close of registration. What Prop 3 allows is at day 14, um, you could prior, so in no more 30 days, you can register at the Secretary of State, you can go to the county clerk, you can mail in your forms. Day 14, now you have to come to the city clerk's office. And from day 14 all the way till 8 p.m. on election day, you can stand in line and register to vote. Um, we, of course wish that we would have had um, our youngest voters come out a little sooner, but it's their right, and a vast majority of them chose to wait until election day. We were there for 40 days registering. We did register a number of people leading up to the last day before the election. However, every single eligible voter has the right to get in line at 8 o'clock. Just like at the polls, you if you've all worked the polls, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, it's 7.59 and a half, can I still vote? Yes. There's 10 other people in line, can I still vote? Yes. Oh my gosh, there's hundreds of people in line, can I still get in line at 7.55 p.m.? Yes. We handed out tickets to everyone in line at the University of Michigan and at City Hall as well, so that we knew who was in line at eight o'clock. So no one registered illegally, no one got in line after eight o'clock. Yes, we absolutely processed the voters who were in line after 8 p.m. They did not get in line after 8 p.m. It took us well past that deadline to process every voter in line. Next question, hold, hold on, somebody's got the mic. So uh, we'll go to that question next. Yeah, so I just, just uh, another thank you for the great work you've done tonight explaining all these hard concepts and the great work you've done on the elections, all the elections I've worked on. I really appreciate um, your um, your work. Um, I did want to ask, has and have any of the laws made it easier for you to register people on that election day so maybe the line won't be so long next time? Yes. <laughs> um, we have obviously been working. We have a coalition that we call UMish Votes. Um, we've been working with them basically since 2020, nonstop. But we've also, um, the Michigan clerks um, have a lobbying arm and we have been lobbying in Lansing for some changes. 
And so some of those things that are coming in 2024 will help us um, process voters more quickly. One of the big ones that I'll highlight is that for towns that um, register more than 500 people on election day, we'll have a special exception in the um, early voting law that we can actually tabulate our early our same day registrations we will be able to tabulate them on site and so instead of having to go through the process of issuing an absentee ballot to someone standing in line even on election day we will be um it'll be us in east lansing and i believe grand rapids are the only ones eligible so this won't be um countywide, but just at the city, um, we will be able to issue regular ballots and process them on site. So that will, if you're one of our AV count board um, workers, that will, we won't be waiting on those student ballots for AV count board. And it will be a faster process for that um, voter transaction as well. Of course, our, our goal is to utilize early voting and get um, people registered and get them to vote, truly vote early. But um, for the election day experience, we have lobbied for a number of legislative changes that will help with um, issuing and processing ballots on campus on election day. Okay. Uh, hi, um, question. Um, are we still going to have the drop boxes? And if so, what measures are going to be taken to make sure they're secure? Yep. So um, earlier in the presentation, we we had um, information about our drop boxes. We're actually expanding drop boxes. Um, the constitutional amendment said that we need a drop box, one box for every 15,000 registered voters. Um, and that has to be accessible 24 seven um, in that 40 day election period. So um, some of the boxes that we have indoors won't count for the formula. They will still be an option for voters who are coming to City Hall, but we're actually adding um, additional boxes. And I believe um, the county, some of the individual cities and townships in the county are as well. I can go back to that slide for you if you missed it. Are, are they gonna have like cameras on them or I mean? Okay. Um, all of the city boxes have cameras on them yeah. and they have the, the box itself. Um, oops. there's a photo of it. The box itself, um, indicates that it's under video surveillance. And, uh, and the question about security, I would just like to say for the city box, um, it is a, a type of steel. It's stronger than like a U.S. postal box, and it doesn't have any bolts on the exterior of the box. It's highly rated as a secure um, drop box. Well, so no, and, there's no um, seams on the exterior of the box. Well, it's, it's I, a, I, I meant secure as, in, as far as like who's dropping off the ballot. Um, is ballot harvesting going to be allowed? I'm not sure what you mean by that. I, I think you mean, you know, delivering one's or having someone else deliver one's ballot. Right now in yeah. Michigan, uh, the only authorized individuals that can be in possession of a, of a voted absentee ballot are the valves, uh, the city or township clerk staff receiving it, postal carriers in the process of delivering, or someone else that the voter authorized to deliver their ballot. Uh, and that individual would have to identify themselves on the returned absentee ballot and sign it as well. Um, it sounds like that's uh, the end of questions for tonight. I am still available. I'll stick around. Uh, both Jackie and I, I think, are very approachable and love to answer questions. However, I don't want to speak for her and her time. Uh, you saw our contact information here uh, at the end. Um, please be in touch with us. Uh, we appreciate all of these questions. They've been excellent questions. Um, there are no bad questions, and we are here increasingly to serve in um, sort of like educational capacities that we have not really been in before, let's say 2020. You know, we're we're out on on the the circuit now doing doing discussions and uh, participating in these kinds of events, which we're so thankful uh, to be here uh, tonight. So thank you very much to the League of Women Voters of Washtenaw County for having us. Uh, this is such an incredible topic, uh, and I know we'll be talking more. Uh, and uh, we just appreciate all that you do on behalf of voters here in Washtenaw County. Uh, thanks also to the Ann Arbor District Library uh, for hosting us tonight. Um, and again, you know, I'll stick around for a little while uh, to answer additional questions.
I was going to ask you all to join me in thanking our speakers, but you just did it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ed and Jackie. I really appreciate it. And um, Ed is here, as he indicated. And please, we have lots of information on behalf of the League of Women Voters. Please feel free to help yourselves. And um, we look forward to seeing you at another event. Thank you very much. Thank you.